afternoon at ACE 2014. My name is David Bloom, and I have the sublime privilege of assembling this esteemed panel to talk about one of my all-time favorite topics, which is customer development and more specifically customer discovery. Uh, our format today, uh, I'm going to give a gross, not grotesque, just gross overview of the concepts for customer discovery. But the bulk of the program is going to be devoted to our panelists, three entrepreneurs who've been there, done that, and are coming here to tell you the tale. And then we'll have time at the end for the burning questions that I know you came through the door hoping that you would be able to ask. And my, my only uh, favor that I'm going to ask you is, turn off your cell phone ringers. If you're live tweeting, that's fine. If you're Matt, that's even better. But don't let a beep get in the way of all of the, uh, the, the uh, interplay that we're going to have today. And then there's a mic that's been set very thoughtfully in the center there for you to use to ask all of your questions. And uh, Roger Rail, who is not in sight so we can make fun of him, insists that the audio portion of our program is very important. So please use it. Uh, so introduction on why we're here. We're here because the art of the start, because the art of networking, because the craft of building a company just doesn't cut it. Uh, the entrepreneurship is already the riskiest of professions. More people fail at entrepreneurship than at bungee jumping, and they call bungee jumping risky. So we've replaced the art of the start with the science of the start. And like good scientists, let's put on our white lab coats, like good scientists, we are looking at data and we are, we are making conclusions based on uh, the hypotheses and the tests that we, we do with those hypotheses. And this whole methodology is in fact the result of a giant uh, experiment that was conducted on the West Coast over the last 10 years where serial entrepreneurs came up with a process for a startup, which is defined as an organization seeking a business model. Not a small company, not a young company, but a non-company that wants to become one. And once you have that hypothesis and you apply scientific principles, you have to ask yourself some questions. And the first question is, why did I ever write that 30-page business plan? Who wrote a 30-page business plan? Come on, don't be shy. Somebody in this room wrote one of those. Who wrote a five-year financial statement for a company that doesn't exist? <laughs> Who wrote an executive summary that was mostly marketing spiel and didn't have any customer language in it? Well, you're going to be. <laughs> nice Good job. Who wrote a pitch deck? Come on, you know I'm handing it out here. You don't. Here. Who pitched, whether you pitched at, uh, at uh, uh, GLEQ or at uh, ACE, who stood up in front of a firing squad and delivered? Oh, you already got one. You already got one. Come on, somebody here. <laughs> These are all risky propositions. And as the biggest investor in your startup, you abhor risk even more than those other investors that you're trying to recruit. So that's why we do customer discovery. We do it to reduce the risk. We do it to replace the hunch and the hubris of knowing that your vision is the right vision and that your company is going to soar and that your product is perfectly matched to your, your uh, target audience, to knowing that deep in your heart against all available raw data. You replace that with humility. The humility says, I don't know. I don't know if this idea is any good. I don't know if the product or service I'm developing is any good. I don't know if people will want it. I don't know if they want it, if they'll buy it. I don't know if they buy it, if they'll use it. And if, I, if they use it, I don't know if it's going to be any good. These are great hypotheses to test. And those companies, I'm sorry, those proto companies, those startups that went through a process of forming and testing those hypotheses, reduced their risk and increased their attractiveness to other investors. And those other investors could be providing money, or they could be providing something more important than money, like access to channels and customers. 
So today's program is about how to succeed in startup because it's the only way you're going to succeed in business. You begin with ignorance. I don't know these things. And then we face, um, is it west or southwest? To our patron saint of customer discovery, his name is Steve Blank. Who's read the Startup Owner's Manual by Steve Blank? Okay, Mary. And over here. So this book is this perfectly named book because it is an actual owner's manual for a startup. It gives you the principles of customer development and it gives you a four-stage process of which customer discovery is the first of those four stages. I define customer discovery, a la blank, as learning from customers. And the irony here is, is that when you're a startup, before you're even a company, you don't have any customers. So your first hypothesis is usually, who's my customer? As a ambitious person, when you discover a customer, the first thing you want to do is sell to her. The principle of customer discovery says, be patient, another non-entrepreneurial skill. And define your customer more broadly as anyone between you and revenue. So that means a customer could be a channel partner. That means a customer could actually be a supplier, could be a competitor. But these are the folks who are out there and can give you the valuable feedback that you need on your idea, not on your product. You don't have a product yet. And by the way, as soon as you show them the product, they're not talking to you anymore. They're talking about the product. So be patient. Find the person between you and revenue. I'm going to be asking each of our panelists how they did that. Meet with them, preferably in their natural habitat. Don't email them. Don't survey them. Don't call them. Face them with the high bandwidth communication that the greatest engineer engineered you and I to conduct. And then listen, listen, listen. Listen first the way you were listening to me now, except for you, you're not listening. Listen, take in the information, take in the content, mix it into that the soup of, your, of, of the concepts that are already in your mind, figure out what they're saying. But then do a second listen that you can't do if you don't do the first one. And that is listen to the whole person. What books do they read? They're on the shelf right behind her. What is she wearing? Where did she come from and where is she going to next? What's on her desk? What's important to her? These are not things that she's going to answer when you say, what's important to you? you know, her cognitive brain is busy coming up with a good answer to that. But you can take that in. That's just listening to the whole person. And then once you've listened to the whole person, only then can you do active listening, which is engaging in a discussion where you're observing their responses and you're feeding them more and more. You're trying to get more and more data, that, that mother load, that gold of customer discovery out of each one of your encounters. Don't sell. Don't talk about a product that doesn't exist. Don't bring a product if it does exist. Just talk about ideas. Talk about challenges. Ask them what's important. And if your product or service is based on customer language, it is by definition perfectly matched to your audience. What typically happens though is that you learn something you didn't expect. You came in there with a great idea and you left with their idea. Let me tell you something, it's better than your idea because they're the customer. Leaving with their idea is good news. Do this 100 times. All right, I got an eye roll back there. You get candy. You know, that's you. Incoming. Good. No, it was, it was the one in front of you. Um, I can throw you another one. It's fine. The, the challenge of doing it 100 times is to find everybody in your market. Because you get a few of these encounters, and, and, and you're really looking at the tip of an iceberg. You're probably looking at early evangelists, the ones who are easy to find. So I ask. Everyone I work with, when you're doing discovery, at the end of the encounter, say, who else should I be talking to? And you'll get three more names. And then keep doing that, and discovery gets easier as you go. The first 20 are excruciating. The next 30, that's when you're starting to get your, your stride. The next 30 after that, that's when you're starting to see patterns emerge. You've heard things, and you're starting to hear them a second and a third time. There might be something to that. 
and then that last 20 before you get from 80 to 100, that's your victory lap. That's where you're, you're um, putting the polish on it. You know now what you know. And chances are, and we'll hear from our panelists, it wasn't what you came in to find out. It's what you discovered, hence the term. This happens in a cycle. The more you learn, the more hypotheses get either proven or disproven. There is no such thing as failure in this environment. If your hypothesis is proven, that's good science. If your hypothesis is disproven, that's good science. And if you're proceeding on an unproven hypothesis, you probably have increased your risk of failure. But remember, there's no failure here. This is all a, uh, uh, an exercise in gathering raw data. And the raw data is these customer discovery encounters. I'm right on time. That was my exposition. Um, write down those burning questions that you have for me, because you're going to have three more entrepreneurs to talk to before you get back to me. Um, these are folks who have been through the discovery mill, and I'm going to be asking them questions about their discovery activities. So I first want to introduce to you the fellow on my left. On your right is Carl Lewis. Carl schlepped up here from Columbus. Don't hate him. Um, he has a lot of uh, traction in customer discovery from having done it on multiple startups. So please uh, cast your uh, attention and uh, all three of your listening ears towards Carl Lewis. Carl, give me some of the high, uh, give me a, a, a top level on lifted, and then tell me what were some of the lifted hypotheses that you went into discovery to test. Uh, hi, ha how's everybody doing? And Carl never needs a mic. <laughs> yeah, um, lifted is a quantified health play. To to gather data out of exercise, um, focusing on form, and then focusing on injury prevention. Uh, the lifted came out of a frustration that I had uh, after gaining 60 pounds, uh, getting married and have a kid, having a kid, uh, going back to the gym, and being allotted an hour of time by my wife to work out. Um, I. Uh, Going to the gym, I felt very lost, and I wish that I had some sort of plan or roadmap, and things kind of progressed from there. Um, because that's where I thought of Lifted, I thought that Lifted's uh, ecosystem would be gyms, and uh, that was very wrong. So you, you had a hypothesis about gyms. Yeah. How did you test it? So I went to uh, every gym owner that I knew. I went to my gym owner. I went to gym owners of my friends. I walked into gyms off the street. I went to Snap Fitness Regional Headquarters and knocked on the door. Um, I, uh, I went to personal training studios and asked them, uh, well, first I pitched the idea of the product uh, of uh, monitoring form, gathering data, and being able to uh, program more efficiently for their, for their clients, which sounds great to me in my head. Uh, for gym owners, and what I found was that uh, gym owners really didn't want that. Disproven hypothesis. Disproven hypothesis, yes. All right, so what happened in those encounters with your gym owners that pivoted your company? Well, the, the thing that um, really sort of pushed me from gym owners towards uh, personal trainers was the level of enthusiasm, this sort of second listening. Um, when, I asked, when I asked them sort of my preliminary questions, I would always get, that sounds really cool, that sounds really awesome. Um, and then when I would send them a follow-up email or a follow-up phone call, I wouldn't get one back. So that kind of told me something that the gym owners as my first go-to-market was not the place that I, need, that I needed to go because they were, they were probably the hardest people to convince um, to purchase the product. So you found other segments where your idea had more traction? Yeah, I found several, um, and I'm finding uh, more every day. Uh, after, I, after gym owners, I went uh, and talked to personal trainers. Personal trainers were much more interested. Um, they, were, they were hungrier for the product, and they're, uh, particularly as a way to differentiate themselves from their competition. Mm. Um, 
uh, there's a there's a billion and one well not a billion and one maybe but uh, there's a lot of personal trainers out there um, you can talk after uh, um, and uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, and uh, any anything that can set them apart from uh, their peers, um, outside of results, which is the only metric that uh, personal trainers objectively have, uh, was a godsend to them. That was an important learning that you got from talking to personal trainers. How did you find them? Gym owners. They knew the trainers. Yeah. Well. So that's that last question. Who else should I be talking to? Um, actually, honestly, uh, I never really, I, I never really explicitly asked the question. But they um, knew. But they knew that uh, they knew that it would be a good thing to have in their gym. They didn't want to maintain it. They didn't want to set it up. Um, but they would love to have it in their gym as a differentiator, but they weren't enthusiastic about it. The personal trainers were. So talk us through a kind of a cradle to grave encounter where you contact, you schedule, you visit, you tell us about what happens in that encounter and then you get knowledge out of that. What, what's the impact now on Lifted? So a, a great um, example of expanding the view of what, who your customer is to be anyone between you and revenue is uh, how I um, got a meeting with, meeting with uh, David Zid, who does personal training and rehabilitation for Parkinson's patients. Um, he was referred to me by a client of my neighbor who, who was dropping off a piece of artwork to be restored. And I went into my spiel uh, pretty immediately. Um, meeting with David was, was pretty awesome. Um, as meeting with, a lot, uh, meeting with a lot of trainers. David was, in particular, was a great experience because he needed, he needs lifted. Um, and before I could get five words out of my mouth, he said, I've been looking for something that will prove that my program is better than anything else out there. And, and, I, am, and this, I want this, this is perfect. And by, you know, talking to my neighbor, talking to his client, um, and, you know, following up, I, I, I called the man, and he called me back a month later. So, it's pretty typical. continuously following up, sending emails, sending text messages um, every once in a while, and uh, uh, remaining positive. It's, extremely important to remain positive uh, is was the was the the sort of the the, the crucible of, of uh, the start of what I hope to be a, a very fruitful relationship um, did you do more encounters in that segment after you had that that learning is this a pivot story it's kind of a pivot story you still have to gather some more I still have to gather some more information I um, there's a there's a, a a neat little um, there's a neat little side plot to the David Zid story. Uh, David uh, do, David does videos. So if you go on YouTube and you search for David Zid, he has videos online doing uh, exercises. And he just got his company bought by Ohio Health Hospital Systems. Um, so the day that I met him, he was going into a meeting with Ohio Health a week later and asked me if I could, if I had a brochure. I said, yes, I, I didn't. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> always say yes. Um, and uh, he, uh, he, he, didn't, he didn't promise me that I, that he would talk about my product. Um, and all I asked him to do was take these brochures and just leave them somewhere. Like, I don't care if you're walking out of the office and you throw them up in the air and say, Olay. Um, <laughs> And uh, uh, so, so there's there's a there's a lot more information to gather on that one. Um, before I before I met with David, I met with a, another trainer another trainer uh, named Victoria, um, firecracker of a lady, uh, 
and I experienced um, sort of the reverse of, of the do not sell uh, 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 principle of, of customer discovery. I explicitly went in there to not sell. And in the middle of the conversation, even though I was trying to explain to her that I wasn't trying to sell, she was trying to spur me on to sell. Who's had this experience? Shut up and take my money. I'll give you later. Um, right, how many total encounters over the course of Lifted's discovery? Somewhere around 900. I talk to a lot of people. Talks I to just, a lot of people. I, it's, it's my thing, actually. So. Um, this is a great story. I'm going to ask you a couple questions in, in the Q&A, but I want to turn it at this point down to, to John Dyer from Ugly Dog just early. Who's here just because of John? Yeah, that's me. John, John I met because he's my neighbor, and I was fascinated with his entrepreneurial story and his discovery story because he doesn't come from the I'm now going to go and learn customer discovery and practice it. He figured it out. So, John, would you please tell us a little bit about Ugly Dog and what were some of the hypotheses that you were testing when you were moving your hobby to your business? Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Point the mic up at you. As David said, uh, my name is John Dyer. I'm the, the owner, founder, and master distiller at Ugly Dog Distillery. We produce a handful of liquor products, vodka, flavored vodkas, rum, gin. We've been in business for about four years. We operate out of a very small space of about 2,000 square feet. Myself, my partner, and two part-time people work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, we distribute, we've been purchased by about 1,600 retail, points of retail in Michigan. We distribute to North Carolina, Idaho, Wyoming, Montana. I'm in discussions with uh, Iowa and in discussions with some people in Florida. So we do a tremendous amount of stuff in a very small space with very little labor uh, and we work extremely hard. Um, that's, that's the, if people ask me how did I get to where I am today, my short answer is we work harder than anybody else. And that's pretty much my litmus for, for picking out the high performance first time entrepreneur, and he's not even a first time entrepreneur, is if you're willing to put out the shoe leather, then you've got it, you've got what it takes. So tell us, um, you, you had some hypotheses because you'd, you'd obviously done some distilling and then the Michigan law passed, what was it, five, six years ago that said that you could uh, drop the license fee from $10,000 to something reasonable with a cap at 60,000 gallons. I can't remember what the exact yeah. metrics are. But how did that then trigger your going from a startup to a business and, and your discovery activity? Sure. That you know, in this being my hobby and in, in changes in careers and other businesses and so forth, it, it, it was something that interested me as a business. But at $10,000 a year just for the fee to have the privilege to do it, it, it was pretty unreasonable for me to start. And when that law changed, I had been working on a business plan, learning about the industry, doing all the things that I would be doing to prepare to move into that industry. And when the law changed that, the, that day, I had a finished product with a label on it and I was, I was off to the races. Um, and, it, it, and in preparing for that, it became very obvious um, that some very basics needed to be met and then, and then some research needed to be done. And you know, one is the, the same old thing is have a great story. When you get in front of that customer, if you don't have a good story, it's hard to keep their interest. Um, number two is have something great to offer them. If, you're, if your product doesn't offer something over the next guy's product, you're going to have a hard time and, and struggle. Our story was that that I built a distillery in my garage. I hand hammered copper to build our distillers with techniques I learned from a coppersmithing book that was copyrighted in 1865. I designed, <laughs> I designed our label. The label has my dog on it. Um, he's ugly. It, yeah, he's, he's ugly. He's a cute dog. Um, everything about our company and our product is homegrown, built, built by me from the ground up. We, we then, with our product, we produce a handmade quality product that's a $30 product that we sell for $20. So in, the, in you know, even in today's economy, but more, more uh, to the point, four, five, six years ago, 
people weren't interested in spending $30 for a bottle of Grey Goose anymore. So if I offer them Grey Goose for $20, I have a little bit of a catch when I'm trying to, to sell my product. So you tested that hypothesis that the, the market had demand for a $30 product at a better price point with hundreds of well, yeah, with, with hundreds of uh, uh, retailers. So of if retailers. I can, if I can continue down, down that line, it, it, it then became very important to understand where we fit as a company and a product in the fabric of the industry that we were moving into. I was, I was fairly surprised to learn that out of the thousands of liquor products in the Michigan liquor book that, that a retailer can order, a vast majority of those, 70% of them, are owned by four or five large conglomerates. Diageo, Brown Foreman, Bernard Ricard, they own everything from Absolute Vodka to Captain Morgan's. Mm -hmm. So somehow I have to figure out how I'm going to compete with that. And I'm going to not compete with that by trying to do it the way they do it. I'm going to do it the opposite of the way they do it. And they don't have a personal face. They can't get in front of the, the, the retailers and the consumers that they're trying to sell to, but I can um, so, so that was our, was our approach. And it, it, it also came about because of the way that uh, sales representation happens. All of those products are imported into Michigan. So they have to have somebody here acting as their sales agent. So the retailers are communicating with the distributor through a sales rep. Well, if I just go hire a sales rep to do the same thing for me, they've got Jack Daniels as, as a very well entrenched, mature company with huge sales in this state that they're just collecting a check from as a maintenance issue, and I'm asking them to go wear their shoes out trying to sell my brand new product that they're not gonna make very much money off of. It's just not gonna work. So our conclusion was that the only way, the only person who's gonna have as much enthusiasm about what we do is me. So we have to do it ourselves. So we spent um, every waking moment telling our story to anybody who sells liquor that would listen. Every what were day, some of those encounters like? Because they're not used to talking to the actual distiller. They, they, they aren't. Some of them, the first question was, who's your sales rep? They didn't even know why I was talking to them. <laughs> uh, every single one of them told us they would buy it just to get rid of us. And we thought we were being super successful <laughs> in the beginning until we realized that only about 12, 14, 15 percent of them actually were, was purchasing the product. One of, one of the key things that I discovered that, that told me that I was on the right track was one of, one of the first questions that we asked was, when was the last time that they had seen a sales rep? And almost all of them said never, because the sales reps aren't going around to every mm -hmm. little liquor store and every little place trying to tell them to buy Jack Daniels because it's already on their shelves. They don't need to do that. So I knew I was doing the right thing when I found out that the people I would have hired to do this job wouldn't have done it anyways, which was my <laughs> hypothesis in the beginning. Um, so that's, that's not a pivot, that's a validation of a, of a hypothesis that says the way I'm going to break into this market, the way I'm going to compete David and Goliath style, is by slinging a rock instead of holding a big, big sword. Sure. Sure. So how did that discovery help you then deal with channels, deal with partners, deal with whoever's invested in your business that, that isn't uh, you and Dewey and Ruger? Well, I, I, I think the, the, the pivot in that was the realization that giving this speech and having people interested in hearing it, it didn't really translate into sales and we needed mm. to do something different. It wasn't as easy as just making a speech. So out of that came a whole bunch of other smaller programs that we did that, that were basically follow up for all of these retailers. The retailers are telling you how to sell them and you're just following instructions. Well, they, you know, we, we have a lot of different scenarios where you, it's sort of like consumer marketing, where a consumer has to see a product X number of times before they become interested in it. The retailer is sort of the same way. Mm. The first time you go in, he says yes. The next time he goes in, he says yes. You do a follow-up phone call. You mail him some point of sales material, and a customer finally goes in and asks for it. After all of that happens, then he orders it and gives you shelf space. And then you have to maintain that account after that. So it's you have to keep on driving and working towards it and driving and working towards it. And in concert, while that's happening, because we have this tiered system, particularly when you're selling a consumer product where you have a distributor that's putting it on the shelf, selling it to a retailer who's putting it on the shelf, and then a consumer that has to go buy it, you also have to do consumer education and consumer marketing at the same time. 
because if you have it on the shelf and no consumers go in to buy it, you're dead in the water. If you don't have it on the shelf and everybody knows about it, they don't have anywhere to go get it. So at the same time, we're also developing consumer awareness and, and getting marketing and advertising on a level that hopefully also the retailer sees it on a consumer level, and that's really, really a big catch. If, if uh. that retailer sees you in a, in a in a, in a marketing aspect, it helps him put your product on your shelf. And we, we did, um, I, uh, our whole campaign was wrapped around what I called free advertising. And we've been in everything from Cranes Detroit to every front page of every newspaper, AnnArbor.com. Um, we've been on the Discovery Channel, national television, that's aired reruns all around the world for 18 months. We've, we've gotten tons of consumer awareness. Now, do you that. do a lot of PR to get that, or do folks find your story to be so interesting and compelling that they want to get it in front of their audiences? Uh, both. Because if you're doing the PR, there's, there's a learning opportunity there that says, okay, I was not making traction with this sector, with this segment of, of uh, distributors until they saw me on the Discovery Channel or until they saw me in Cranes. Yeah, that's, that was, it, it sort of all works together in a web. You know, if you can't, if you can't car start creating all of these points and then bring them all together to some cohesive action, then you're never going to get anywhere. So if you can't, create all of those things on a consumer level and work at the retailer and all of the issues that are in that whole fabric of that industry competing against these big giants, if you can't create a system that's going to make all of that fit together, you'll, I would be like a lot of other distillers I know that have gone out of business because they think that I'll hire a sales rep and he'll sell my product. Well, all he's going to do is place it on the shelf. You're forgetting the whole other half of the system, mm. which educates all of you guys that the product exists to go into a store and ask for it, if not buy it, because it's already on the shelf. John, how many retailers did you talk with? I probably, my partner and I probably personally have spoken with, I would say in the neighborhood of a, of a thousand, somewhere in there. And these aren't always like um, discovery sessions, because once you're on the shelf, you're continuing to listen to them Absolutely. in order to maintain your shelf space. Ab Absolutely. Discovery never ends. The process of learning from your customers is what got you to be able to start a business. That business is not static any more than your marketplace is. And if discovery was a success factor at the one, it's probably going to be a success factor at the two and the three and the four also. Yeah, sure. We, we do all kinds of follow-up. We get reports from the distributor that tell us who's purchased how much on what frequency. And we treat customers that buy a half a case a week consistently far differently than a customer who bought two bottles and hasn't purchased it again in six months. <laughs> and we have, we have different programs that approach those customers in different ways and we do different things for them. Because if we just forget them once they buy something, they may not be a customer again for a year until somebody else walks in the store and asks them to, to order them a bottle. So we, we stay on top of all of those scenarios on a, on a daily basis almost. That's super, thank you John. Sure. Uh, many of you know Grace Shaw from Warmaloo. Um, she was here a year ago uh, walking away with a nice trophy. I was very pleased to hear the discovery story that she told us, uh, that her intern told us in September about a significant pivot, which is something that we didn't cover a lot in the exposition, but we've heard it now from Carl and from John. This is when you take your startup in a different direction based on the preponderance of data, not based on one encounter, but several that take you into a different direction. Grace has recently returned from India, yes. where Discovery took her in a different direction. Can you tell us a little bit about Warmaloo and tell us a little bit about how your ongoing Discovery internationally is uh, fueling this latest pivot? Will and do. move the mic towards you. All right. Hi, everyone. It's so great to uh, be here back in the US with you all. And um, I'm so excited to share all of our developments, our two and a half years of customer discovery with you today. So just to give you a sense of Warmaloo, for you all who um, have not heard of Warmaloo, we're a multi-application instant heat and medical device startup. And what, what makes us so passionate is that we are working towards our social mission to prevent and treat infant death from hypothermia. And so not, we did not know this at first, but 140 infants die every hour worldwide from hypothermia-related causes. That's uh, over a million infants annually, and there are tens of millions of infants that are born preterm at risk for hypothermia. 
And the reason why it really resonated with my team, so unlike uh, some of these folks who, especially John, you knew your industry sector, uh, my team was composed of material science engineers who were undergraduate students at the University of Michigan. So we learned about that problem and it really resonated with me because I was born one month preterm. So when we heard about infant deaths, 80% of those take place in developing countries and India comprises of one third of preterm births, one out of eight, which are likely to be hypothermic. Mm. And for those of you who don't know how hypothermia affects infants, it's a comorbidity with birth asphyxia. So it will help contribute to a significantly more challenging uh, health outcome, not just in the first 30 days of life, but later on as an infant develops and uh, grows um, physically up until the age of five. And you've got consequences afterwards. So, so when you were um, a group of, of uh, MSc students, you had a set of hypotheses about what Wormaloo, what the product was, what the market was, and how you were going to go to market. And you took those hypotheses out there, and what happened? So we started off with just, we knew there was a problem, we knew there was a number. We didn't know who was going to be paying for um, what kind of solution, and in fact, we didn't even at first know that an infant warming blanket would be a solution that could reduce and treat the deaths from infant hypothermia. So the first hypothesis, so we've had the opportunity now to talk to individuals who are end users, decision makers, influencers, and buyers. Everyone in four, between you and revenue. Yeah, between yeah. us and revenue in four different markets. So we talked to those who are in neo neonatal intensive care units here in the US. These units are in hospitals, they treat preterm infants. We've also talked to non-governmental organizations in developing countries. We've also talked to outdoor recreational gear, those who want heated technology in their products, as well as pre-hospital and EMT market. And finally, this is the market that is revenue generating and it is able to subsidize our social mission, the retail heat therapy market. Mm. You had originally had a, a buy one, give one. Exactly. And this is a, a better model for you? Yes. Tell, tell us how you discovered that. So first, all right, I'm going to go through all of the different markets. So we started initially wondering if maybe you could buy one here in the US through these neonatal intensive care units and then give a blanket overseas. The buy one, give one model is used by Tom Shoes, Warby Parker, a number of different social uh, ventures here in the US. One child per laptop. One child per laptop, exactly. So there's- One laptop per child. It's a proven business model in the social entrepreneurship space. But unfortunately, what we found, we talked to seven different uh, neonatologists initially, and then later 50 here in the United States at a number of different hospitals, some of which you might know, like DMC Children's Hospital, CS Mott, Henry Ford, Sparrow Health, Beaumont. We talked to those neonatologists, nurse practitioners, we talked to um, those who are just primary care physicians, and learn that, in fact, liability is their most significant challenge. In fact, mm. obstetricians are the most highly sued out of medical professionals, because if something goes wrong with their baby, someone is going to sue someone, apparently, is what we learned. And so instead of wanting to put infants into an infant warming blanket, which we were developing, people would prefer to put, and they have a culture based around putting infants into high-tech incubators. Mm. So that's when we started realizing the buy one, give one model here in the US might not work for our particular infant warming blanket product. Because they're so liability averse, they have to exactly. get out all of the technology in order exactly. to avoid a lawsuit. Yes, and the lead time for trying to overcome some of the, the um, that kind of culture too around incubators, it was not, it's just impractical to try to do it as a startup. So then we dived into outdoor recreational gear because a lot of the doctors we talked to, they started saying, well, why don't you make a jacket for me? Why don't you put your heat technology into our socks, our, um, our gloves? Because we, we had the opportunity to just, at the very end, we never talked about what we were doing. We were just always fact finding. We wanted to understand their problems first and not talk about what we were doing because otherwise you're biasing your potential customer that you're trying to learn Poisoning the discovery from. by whipping out the product. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm also, so I 
typically was not the person in talking. I would go into these meetings with my most quiet VP of technology or VP of operations now, and they would do the talking. We would practice the questions we were going to ask beforehand, and then they would ask, because I was so excited about trying to address this problem. It, it biased nearly every encounter that I had with customer discovery and validation. I could see that. I could Me too. See that. It happened. So then we went into outdoor recreational gear, where we talked to 160 different individuals and uh, 45 non-governmental organizations at the same time, because we were setting up pilot clinical trials for the heat technology in Bangalore, India. So out of those individuals, 112 were in the outdoor recreational space. So, and later I'll tell you how we found those people. But so when we talked to them, it turns out that the, yeah, so the heat tech we originally had it as tubes, but they talked about how they wanted it to be easy to use and easy to reuse if there was a heat tech. They just wanted it to be quick, instant. They did not want to think about how they were reusing it. So we knew that we had to change our design. In addition, we learned that out of all the different things we were looking at, socks are like the top thing, then gloves, because people really want to heat up their extremities, even though According to established medical protocol through EMTs and hospitals, the best way to treat hypothermia is by warming the center, the core of the body. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. tend to think that putting up and applying heat to their extremities is the best way to relieve themselves mm. of cold, which is not true, by the way. Just so you know, if you are cold, put heat packs onto your torso because that's where your heart is pumping blood to the rest of your body, not the other way around. Hands, feet are not pumping blood. So but my hands are cold. Yeah, but hands are not pumping blood. Right, so um, that being said, so we knew that taking our heat technology and engineering it into, you know, socks and gloves was going to be very challenging. So then we started looking at pre-hospital and the ambulance market. So just for those of you who um, are not, you know, the people who are in this market are serving patients before they ever get to a hospital setting, before they ever see a doctor. So you've got EMTs, paramedics, um, EMT group purchasing organizations that we talk to. We talked to over 45 um, different people at about 30 different organizations. And so, and I'll tell you the time periods for these different conversations too, how we vetted the markets. Mm -hmm. But what we, our hypothesis for this market, we knew there had to be volume because mm -hmm. we had seen some of the statistics and the data on hypothermia and how many people are treated uh, before the hospital for hypothermia. So we looked at this market with the hypothesis that there would be volume and the price point would be above um, $10 per heat pack. But unfortunately, what we learned after talking to all those individuals was that there was volume. One group purchasing organization purchases 1.25 million heat packs annually. And that's an every year kind of purchase. They're on contract for that with their other associates. However, the price per heat pack was 56 cents to $3, which when you're a startup and you are looking for the first customer who's going to be the fastest path to profitability, especially in the case of a social venture that needs to be sustainable and subsidize the social mission, this was not the market to go to. So finally, I was called out to um, finally have a little, b I do have a social life, I promise. And um, no. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I, work, I used to work at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, which provided um, classes to those who are above the age of 50. And um, not like how to use computers, but like they provide arts, humanities, math, sciences, et cetera. So I met with some of my former coworkers over dinner. And when I was talking about Warmaloo, they asked, do you have the heat pack? And coincidentally, I did. But first I was just, and I wasn't even asking about problems, but they started bringing up problems. Like, oh, you know, I have a lot of pain resulting from my arthritis, that it seems that wrapping a heated, you know, rice bag helps. And then my other coworker said, yeah, speaking of which, you know, I mean, haven't you thought of elderly folks? Like, I have diabetes, and sometimes I can't mm. feel my hands and feet, mm -hmm. and they're so cold. So I put heat packs on them to, to help with that. And so I <laughs> took out the I was like, they discovered you. They discovered me. Yeah. <laughs> and we had been working together for a very long time. And so what happened was that I showed them how it worked. When I 
clicked the disc and they were touching it, feeling it, my coworker almost, both of them, almost jumped across the table at me and they were just like, Grace, how, do, how much does this cost right now? And I, I was just like, well, <laughs> what? Excuse me? And they're just like, no, like, how, what's the price of this? Because they said cost, I thought they meant like my manufacturing cost. So I was no, they to wanted think. to get it on the shelf exactly. at CVS. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and they were like, "Can I buy this? Like, where can I buy it?" And all of these questions, they nearly grabbed. They and when I said, "No, you can't take this one. I'm still testing it," they were just like, "Why? Aww. Why do you still need to test it? And why? Why, why do you have it?" <laughs> so they gave me checks that same day. So talk about when you shut have, up and take my exactly. money. Exactly. <laughs> so when you talk about that, it's like that is the kind of customer you're really looking for. And then since then, we've talked to over 70 different individuals from end users to purchasers to um, influencers and decision makers from the different channels. So direct to sales to people um, through retail channels like the big box, CVS, Walgreens. Um, and some farm, smaller pharmacies that also sell medical devices to elderly folks. So that is the story of our discovery. And the, uh, one last thing, sorry. Go, go, I know go, you're go. going to keep going. So the time frame that took, because we started as a, a very young, un, unexperienced team. We didn't know these sectors, but we had learned about them. So with neonatal intensive care units, that was about, um, we spent three months on that. September 2011 to January 2012. Outdoor recreational gear took longer because now we knew the customer discovery process. That was January 2012 to January 2013. The pre-hospital and EMTs was January 2013 to July of 2013. And then the retail heat therapy market is current, very current. So July 2013 to, to date. So you're lining up those encounters now. Well, we have sales. <laughs> Well, my, my, my question to you then yeah. is, okay, this is a, a long and ongoing discovery process that has pivoted your company in a very significant oh, yeah. way. How do you, with your limited resources, you have limited time, limited cash, your team bandwidth is what it is, you've got outside commitments like a day job at early. Yes, as a project manager. Right. How do you conduct customer discovery in the real world when it's that intense and you have these limitations? Well, so just so you all know, I was still a student during most of this. So I was an undergraduate engineering student in material science engineering, and then I became a master's student at the Ross School of Business. And now I'm working full time as a project manager at the university, and Warmaloo is all evening, all weekend. So there are 24 hours in a day, 16 when you factor in sleep, and then maybe you have five to eight hours per week that you, know, you factor in for a full time job, and then, if you have another 16 hours that you put on, on, you put in during the weekends, you actually have about 46 additional hours of time that you can put in for customer discovery if you really want to. That's if you have a social life and maybe 60 or more if you have friends who like working on projects at the same time as you're working on your mm -hmm. projects. You should keep those friends forever, by the way. So. If there is something that you as an entrepreneur, so most entrepreneurs I meet are passionate about the product or service or technology that they're trying to bring to this world, whatever it may be. When you are that passionate and you want to see that product breathe and live in the light of day, you make time to understand who's going to buy your product, who's going to use it. And that's something I can't stress enough. If you cannot if you cannot make time for your startup or customer discovery to understand your customers, then it might not be the right venture for you. And maybe you better just get a day job. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. All right, but you just mentioned that you were doing this when you were students. Yeah. And you've transitioned Warmaloo now from being what was a student project. You've fledged it out. It's a business. What were some of the challenges in doing that? Oh, man. Okay. So <laughs> the two, I think the two, well, okay, there's really three, but the two biggest ones. First, if you're, so I don't know about most of you, but when, you know, like I was going through school, like, you know, when I started working on Warmaloo 21, 22, and now still in my 20s. So, yeah, I know, sorry. <laughs> so uh, with that, you need to understand, especially if you're trying to create, you know, a medical device startup, but, you know, whatever product or service or technology you're trying to bring forth, you really need to have full acceptance of the responsibility that you're about to take on, that it is going to take mm. lots of hard work 
you're going to have to learn how to work smart. You, have, you might not have industry experience under your belt, so you need to get it by talking to people and sometimes tagging along. I went on EMT rides with EMTs and paramedics to learn about things. That's I not easy. Track. Yeah, yeah. You gotta jump through some it. hoops to get there. Yes. <laughs> and so when you're at that point, you need to accept that there are re real people who are going to be using your products and services, and goodness gracious, if something goes wrong, you are on the line. There's a series of liabilities that you have as an entrepreneur, so it's sure. your job to mitigate risk and really take a critical look at all of your business processes, your supply chain, your different ways to produce your product, who's going to be touching this product from start to finish, who's on your team. If you have someone who's you know, not really, they're like party Susie, or sorry, sorry, not that I know any like party Susies, uh, but if you have anyone who's not putting in the time and the commitment and willing to put in that acceptance of risk, you, you know, we had a fundamental shift in our team yeah. mentality. So then the second thing, team. Ideas are a dime a dozen, but it's the team that executes it that is priceless. Every Mary investor Kate. here will endorse yes. that. Yes. They hear lots and of ideas, but they invest yep. in teams. Yes. Right, and Adrian? It's completely true. And in fact, um, Paul Graham, founder of Y Combinator, wrote that really we invest in companies that are just a couple of guys in a garage. They know when they make the investment that the idea will probably change. It's the team that is really going to push it forward. And that's something that you realize when you transition, that who's going to be on there making that commitment, who's going to be putting in the hours and the, you know, the sweat, the blood, the tears, because you're going to have highs and lows and you're going to need to be able to think critically. So who is going to be on that path with you? You're going to have times when you do not like your, <laughs> your person. You're going to have disagreements. Just, it is a relationship. It's more intense than a, like, or maybe not, sorry. I don't have that, kind of, I'm not married. But I've heard it's like being married, very much so. So that's really the second thing, is that you start vetting and really looking critically at your team. Third, funding. So as a student, we had student loans. So just like, you know, I, I come, I'm a Michigander, so uh, I, my, my parents were thankfully able to help me pay for some things, but I also had loans I had to take out, about $47,000 worth, and um, I had some scholarships, but they weren't enough to pay for everything. Mm. Same thing with my co-founders. So what, you can do, there are some different opportunities for grants for people who, who are students to transition into an entrepreneurial role. Yeah, check your program. I think there's actually, a, <laughs> there's going to be another, not in this room, but in the next yeah. room on just that topic. Yeah, which is great. And because we struggled with that. In fact, two, well, almost three out of three of the original co-founders, we are bootstrapping our way through our first sales mm -hmm. by having full-time jobs on top of Warmaloo. And, and the funny thing is, is your full-time job is actually your sideline. Exactly. That's your salary. All right. Anybody who's got a sideline like that. Uh, all right. Okay. I can, I can hit him from here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I want to open it up for questions, yep. um, the, both the burning questions that you came in with and the ones that occurred to you while listening to Carl, John, and Grace. I've got questions as well. So as you amble up to the mic there, just kind of wrestle the floor away from me. John, I had a question for you based on, on your, your dis discovery story. What was the most surprising thing that you learned when talking with these retail customers? You know, I, I'm always a pretty straightforward guy. And you know, if you ask me a question, I'm going to give you the painful answer. And I was really surprised that both retailers uh, and consumers, uh, they all lie. Nobody tells you the truth. They'll tell you they're going to buy your stuff, and then you turn around and walk away, and it doesn't happen. You have faith in your fellow man. I do. I don't anymore, but I did when I started this. <laughs> The downside of discovery, yeah. Yeah, so that, that really you know, caused us to, to create a more in-depth approach to what we were doing as far as selling to at least the retailers. Gotcha. Uh, question for you, Carl. Um, so you've been through multiple discoveries with multiple startups, what do you know know that you wished that you'd known before discovery? I would just like to say that I've never been more grateful for pants than I am right now. Um, We're not in England. Uh, so, like, like David said, I, I started with a, 
a legal services startup. I went to a geolocation app. I went to a, um, uh, a customer discovery application. Mm -hmm. um, and the, one of the biggest things besides, you know, wishing that you know, I had known that I was going to start a fitness company. I would have foregone the 60 pounds that I gained. Um, is uh, let your customers define your product for you. Um, and an MVP is, is, the M is really important in that. Um, Minimum viable product. Th thank you, David. I, I they think it was the most valuable player. Um, <laughs> uh, Doing, you know, customer discovery doesn't stop, um, but uh, there's a, uh, there's a, um, there's, there's great value in, in having the wisdom to know the difference between um, focus and stubbornness. Um, uh, I have, I have, a, I have a, a, a habit of wanting to, wanting my product to be everything to everyone. And um, my first product scriber was like that. And through customer discovery, I discovered that in order to make any money, I needed a really robust product that would take 15 MIT level engineers and um, a half of a year just to get a minimal viable product that, it, that would get me to market. Um, with, uh, and as I've, it, as I've iterated through ideas and um, executions, um, I've come to Lifted, which I can take the same product, um, make it, and as I've made it simpler and easier to put together, I've expanded my customer base. Uh, just last night, um, I've, I've, I uh, have decided uh, to listen to some of my customers and actually go for golf. Um, New sector. New sector, who are and golf instructors are actually even GMs, more personal trainers. Yeah, Parkinson's, golf, golf. Uh, you're gonna have to have 900 more. Yeah. yeah. So and um, uh, I, that I think that's the biggest thing is is knowing the difference between stubbornness and and focus. Uh, it's not stubbornness so much as it is our desire to be available to you that leaves us in this room after our allotted time at 3.30 or out in the hallway. This is not the end of our program. It's the beginning of a conversation. Uh, come and attack us now, now that the program's over with the questions that you didn't want to ask in the public forum. And then if five minutes from now or five hours from now or five days from now you think of something, uh, get back to the ACE folks. Uh, we want to keep this, this conversation going both through the um, the ACE program, but also through two other programs that are doing uh, customer discovery. One of them is the Michigan Marketing Minds, which is sponsored by Ann Arbor Spark, and then Entrepreneurial Development University, which kicks off after Spark's boot camp. Uh, if you're on the ACE list, you'll get notifications for both of those. We're at the end of our program, so I want you to give it up, please, for Carl, John, and Grace. Thank you for your discovery stories. I hope that uh, you now have the bug the science of the startup, uh, no diss to the art of the startup if you want to do it risky.